All right, we're so lucky to have with us Tom Nash. He's one of my favorite financial YouTubers. Thank you so much, Tom, for being on the show with us today. I feel like it's a fanboy moment for me because I'm such a huge uh, fan of your show. I remember like a year ago, I was watching your 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 video and all of a sudden, out of the blue, uh, you mentioned, hey, you should watch Tom Nash. He makes great videos. And I had like 20,000 subs or something like that. I was like, oh, wow. I never thought I'd be a guest on this, on this show. So I'm actually a huge fan. Oh, ditto, Tom. We're really huge fans. We watch you all the time. In fact, um, you were saying just the other day something that's really relevant to a lot of our viewers right now, which is that a lot of people who are invested in, let's say, Tesla, uh, they're watching their investment just go down, down, down. And you had to tell you know somebody, hey, look. Uh, you can't lose faith right now because I don't know. I don't know. What's your advice? Like a lot of people are feeling right now, like, I guess I should just sell everything and wait till this is over. Humans are very social animals. Let's put it this way. Okay. So, you know, the pranks where 10 people in the elevator, a person walks in and everybody sits down. So the person has to like, he sits down or, or they clap. And so we're social human beings. So when we see people behave a certain way in mass, we tend to kind of join in. Everybody loves quoting Warren Buffett saying, well, when everybody's greedy, I'm fearful and vice versa. But when it comes time to act accordingly, it doesn't really work that easily because it's tough when things are, uh, you know, when the, the feet are hitting the shan, so to speak, without demonetizing the stream. So <laughs> I'm going to try to keep your guys uh, monetized, even though I've, no I've been known to destroy monetization on multiple streams before. <laughs> But when that happens, the tendency is to run away. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of a human instinct. You know, we run for safety. The problem with this theory is that uh, over the course of history, going back, let's say, to modern history since 1981 going forward. I was born 1981. That's why I used this year. I'm, on, I'm old as f Oh, so I just did it. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> history shows one clear thing, guys. The S&P 500 over the course of a quarter of a century... If you take 20 years, 20 years, it never goes down. Uh, it will have a bad year. It, pr it can have a bad decade. You know, dot-com bubble crashed. We had a whole decade, even plus, of, uh, of subpar performance. But if you just stay long enough and stay for the course of 20 years, the S&P 500 will give you an average of 8 to 10% per year of the course of those 20 years because even after you had five or six horrible years, the market will bounce. So... If you know that for a fact, uh, getting out is basically missing on that because there's a lot of the human behavior that prevents people from uh, from being able to time the market. Because I can I hear people say, well, Tom, you have been preaching that and that you've seen my videos. So, you know, I've been saying, hey, things are going to go from bad to worse. Right. So, Tom, if you're saying this, why not sell now? Right. And I say, look, I'll tell you why I, I can see it coming as well. But the question is. Can you time the market correctly? Can you identify the exit point? And can you identify the re-entry point? And yes, you know, some people can dunk a basketball from the free throw line. I've seen it happen. I've seen MJ do it. But can most people do it? No. Can 90% of people do it? No. It's probably like 1% of basketball players that can do such a thing. So are we going to try to dunk from the free throw line? No, we're going to take a layup. So if, if we cannot effectively time the market, and I mean, generally speaking, retail investors. Should we try to? No, because this is what's going to happen. Even if you identify the exit point, if you decide now, well, I'm going in cash right now because I can see the avalanche coming. It's a decent bet, right? Let's say you timed it to perfection. You got out on time and everything crumbles. How do you know when it's the right time to re-enter? How do you know where's the bottom? Because let's say the market is down 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%. Okay, is now the bottom? Is now not the bottom? And let's say all of a sudden the market goes up by 10%. You say, well, should I jump back in? No, let's see. Let's wait and see if this is sustainable. All of a sudden it's up 30%. And like, oh, I'm not going to buy something 30% higher than it was just a few days ago. I'm, uh, I'm not going to overpay. And then you're way far behind. Everything is up like 100% and you're still out. And so there's this very high likelihood if you jump out is that you will not be able to time re-entry because... Peter Lynch talked about it multiple times. A vast majority of the wealth that's being created when the market goes from, from bottom back to top gets created in the beginning, in the initial spikes. And those are literally impossible to time. So for most investors that are long-term investors, not day traders and such or swing traders, there's absolutely no better cheat code than time in the market versus trying to time the market. So I'm happy that you saw that video. I hope a lot of people will see it. 
I'm sure we'll get angry comments. So you make this sort of video, you know what's going to happen. The market is going to be tanking for the next six months. and everything. Tom, but you told us to stay. Well, I meant as a stay for a decade, a decade and a half, you know. Uh, but I, I get it. I'm willing to take the heat and the criticism that will come with it if most of the people will understand the idea and will treat it as a nest egg for their retirement and not anything to make a quick buck like in 2020. Do you remember there, there used to be a YouTuber called Boogie2988? was a big YouTuber. He has 5 million subscribers. So he put out a video a little a year ago saying, I got rich off of uh, crypto. He put all his YouTube money off that he ever made on YouTube into crypto, made a lot of money, and he put a video just a couple of weeks ago saying, I need your help. I'm, I'm about to go bankrupt. Money that comes fast goes fast. That's my motto, bro. Just take your 8% on average a year and just uh, ride out the tough times. To your point, I mean, I remember back in like 1998, I thought this must be the top of the market. I'm getting out. And boy, was I stupid because it kept going up for two or three more years. And I could have, there was lots of gains near the end, but I was out. And like you said, I didn't know when to get back in. So really good point there, Tom. Um, but I want to push back on something. It seems like every financial advisor now is saying kind of the same naysayer stuff, which is we're about to get into this really bad recession. And are we just doing groupthink? Is it just going into that elevator and everyone's sitting down? Because I want to push back a little bit here. People like Kathy Wood and Elon talk about technology. Are we counting that enough for all the gains that technology might be giving us? Because I just, I don't know, this feels different than any other recession I've seen in my life. It feels different because the job market is hot and the economy doesn't feel like it's in a recession. Exactly. Right. So then how are we in a recession? Right. Because you know, I mean, it's like typically how? you can't get a job. So therefore I'm not spending money on, on things like burgers and uh, trips. And so then there's less money in those markets. But now it seems like everyone has a job who wants a job. So this is just the weirdest recession. I've ever heard of the job numbers that just came out you know the numbers don't lie the, the job numbers are super hot and people have money it's not like people are broke right now so why is this different well I'll tell you guys here's the thing first of all there's this whole pointless academic debate of what's the proper definition of a recession is it two consecutive quarters of negative GDP which we had or is it the more elaborate kind of abstract version that they use to say that that there is no recession from political reasons I say that shit don't matter and I'll tell you why. I think the job market numbers are a little bit lagging and think the pain is still ahead. I think unlike 2008 and unlike 2000, this recession isn't going to be sudden because as you probably remember this, right? 2000 was like, boom, all of a sudden everything just rug pull. And I remember turning on the TV and I was a kid. Uh, I was I was 18 uh, or 19. I don't remember. Some of the, uh, what the, what's this? The grown-ups, what are the f***ing doing? The f***ing assholes, right? 2008, I was already in it. And I remember, like, the banks basically said, oh, we completely screwed up. The whole system was, you know, basically a, a Ponzi scheme. The whole banking system was basically going going under and Lehman Brothers took the hit by other states. Now it's a whole different game because those recessions happened because of greed. You had greed in 2000. You had greed in 2008 that caused people to do uh, illegitimate things that eventually collapsed the system and broke the market. That's the classic way recession happened in the U.S. <laughs> it happened before, it will keep happening. This recession is really different because this recession didn't come from greed or any kind of uh, misuse or abuse of the system. This recession was caused by the government. I, I, I would, I, And I want to say unintentionally. I know there's a lot of people out there who have their own f***ing theories. I don't have wear a tinfoil hat and I don't live in my mama's basement, so I'm not about to entertain those. I think that this was a policy mistake that caused this. And so it, it will play out differently than the ones we experienced as kids and teenagers and grown-ups before because you and I were kind of in the same age group, so we've, we've seen those play out. This one is playing out a little bit different because this one basically uh, started off like a, like a slow-moving train because what happened is that's how I interpret things. Pandemic hits the world. Nobody knows what the hell this thing is. You obviously assume the worst. And yes, there is political pressures to, to assume the worst and, you know, don't ever let a good crisis go to waste kind of thing. For sure, opportunism is definitely a part of the politician's toolbox, right? But I think genuinely the assumption was, well, this thing might actually collapse our economy because people will be stuck at home, et cetera, et cetera. So massive money dumping starts on the market to basically stop everything from collapsing. Now, it's addictive. Once you start getting free money, you know, people say, well, oh, why did you do this, Fed? You all ask for this. <laughs> Everybody here, I don't see anybody sending back their stimulus check. 
<laughs> find me somebody who sent back their check or said I don't want it, right? So people kind of start encouraging that because it's fun. Individuals enjoying this free money. Companies get to borrow at zero rate interest, free money. Real estate developers get free money, which basically means everything is just a margin at this point, right? So it's tempting to keep it going. And this is what started to happen. At some point, we had a window of opportunity to stop this. In the beginning, the whole Federal Reserve approach of, well, this inflationary spike is transitory, was misguided, but not irrational. It, there was a case to be made when the Fed basically had to make a decision. Well, what are we doing with all this excess money? We're seeing inflation starts to creep up. There was a case to be made that inflation is might be a little bit transitory because there were supply chain shocks. There were actually legitimate things that happened in the world that not didn't have to do with the money printer. As things progressed, we kept on printing money. And when I say printing money, I mean in massive quantities. The balance sheet of the Fed has never been greater. The U.S. national debt has never been greater. We basically said, well, you know, let's just keep doing this. At some point, the Fed, I think, was politically stuck in the situation where they had to feed the lie of, oh, well, this is transitory. Whether this because there were policy mistakes, but whatever happened, this thing was played out in front of us way longer than it should have. And unfortunately, because the Fed basically let this thing play out without starting to get into restrictive interest rate hikes, what ended up happening is the train has now left the station. So at this point, everybody is still burning through the money that we got in 2020. The entire system is pumped with a shit ton of money. That's why everything still feels great. The problem is and I've told this story in one of my videos. Remember my story about the king with the with the safe, with the gold? Eventually, this thing, it has to end. So now, the Fed at some point basically says, well, you know, we're retiring the war transitory, much too late. And we're starting to, to take this seriously. Too little, too late. At some point, they go, well, this is not just not transitory. This is actually really, 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 really bad. I mean, we will throw everything. Like, you know, forget everything. Forget the, the economy. For, look, we have to... Like, the narrative has completely changed. If you go to John Paul, transitory, this John Paul is like two separate people. So now they're throwing everything they got at it. So pretty much a, a point each time or close to a point each time, 0.75 each time. As you just pointed out, People still have jobs. They have plenty of money. The job numbers are out. The economy feels great. Nothing's happening. Here's the crazy part. At this point, this is how this thing is going to play out. If you take a look at the numbers that came out today, the PPI numbers that came out today, right? So PPI numbers are 8.5% year over year. So if you're providing services or building goods or whatever, your gross profit went down by 8.5%. Now, that's a lot. What ends up happening is... The companies that experience this, which is pretty much almost every single company in the market uh, right now, except a few that I can think of, they have a problem. They have to make a very tough decision. They have to make a decision, basically, look, we either uh, start rolling on the cost to you guys and you pay for it. If Usually they'll do it if they have leverage, if they're a non-discretionary product like, you know, toothpaste or toilet paper, whatever, right? Or they can say, well, we're going to absorb it. Because we can, we don't have the pricing power to raise prices. In both choices, ironically enough, whether choice A or choice B, the result is the same. The result is that people will have less free disposable income to spend on uh, discretionary shit. Because if you're paying more for toothpaste and toilet paper, you have less for furniture and clothing and electronics. If your company terminated employees because they had to absorb the cost, you now don't have a job, so you have less to spend on this. So the result is the same. Now, this creates an, a, a very slow but very scary effect, a snowball effect, where the amount of disposable income in the market goes down and down and down, people spend less, and it's kind of a self-feeding collapse of retail. The problem is these things take months, if not years, to actually manifest. How far along are we in this is probably the next question you would ask yourself. Look at AMD. They're like kind of like the, the Tesla of the chip world. They're the best of the best. They missed. They not only miss, they've corrected the prognosis for, for revenues uh, after one month into the quarter by 25%. So they started the quarter with $6.7 billion of revenues guidance, and they've adjusted one month into the quarter, basically saying, yeah, it's 25% less because people aren't buying computers. Look at iPhone 14 sales. 
and we can talk about what happened with Target and Walmart and all these companies. So you look at the real estate market slowing down. So this whole thing is slowly starting to, there's a lot of canaries and a lot of coal mines starting to pop up. So if you want to ignore it and say, well, this isn't happening because I still feel great, sure, go right ahead. But I make an argument that this is your third beer and it feels great, but in about five beers, you're going to throw up in the, in the basement. Is this an opportunity for some people, though, because uh, if the market pulls down the value of companies, let's say, like Tesla, innovative companies, um, and gives us another chance? I mean, I can't remember. And there were so many times people would say to us, Zach and Jesse, I missed it. I didn't get a chance to get in on Tesla. Is this possibly another chance to get in on a very strong company that's just having to weather a really tough time? You know what people say? They say that. And then you know what happens when the price drops? They're like, ah, I'm not buying this on the way down. So, <laughs> <laughs> so they'll probably will be the same people who will not buy it. They go, oh, I missed it. Oh, no, I'm not buying this when it comes down. So they're a lost cause. I think that the Tesla community and I know you guys don't subscribe to the Tesla cult and you've gotten heat for it. And I had the same argument with these people. I dare to say that I don't understand the Tesla semi on Twitter and the barrage of death threats I have <laughs> in my inbox. <laughs> well, I saw, I saw that, Tom, and I, I'm not going to give you a death threat here, but I want to push back on that because we are getting a semi truck and we believe in it. Yeah. Why don't you think the semi truck is all that? And here's my initial argument that was about the semi truck. And this is not even the thing yet, because none of my Tesla valuations have anything to do with anything that's not driving on the road right now. When I made my Tesla DCF and I said that this is a $1,500 stock pre-split, I said this is purely on what's on the ground right now. It does include the bot, the AI stuff. It does include the Cybertruck. It does include nothing, not the Roadster, just based on the 3S, X, and Y. But uh, realistically, we're talking about the 3 and the Y. This is the money maker. So that's how I, I see Tesla. So for me, the whole semi-truck thing is a cherry on top. If they make it, I'll take it. As far as why I'm not excited about it, because as much as I hate to admit it, the vaporware company, Nikola, which it is, by the way, and everything uh, about it, and uh, I know Sandy Monroe liked the truck, but he, he didn't like the Nikola truck. It's a f***ing uh, Iveco uh, tray. Anyway, that's a whole different discussion. Then, yes, I agree that the Iveco tray is a great truck. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't need Sandy Monroe for that. It's, a, it's, it's, it's dominating Europe and it has been for years for a reason. It's kind of a daily, daily uh, de delivery truck. For class eight semi trucks that have to go cross country, I, I always thought that there's a problem with the battery. There's a problem with the weight. There's a problem with the charging times. There's a problem with capacity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that is very hard to solve because uh, for me, you know, a truck isn't really, I don't care about the acceleration. I don't care about nothing of that. I care about it being fuel efficient or energy efficient and being able to maximize payload. With a battery, classic modern wisdom says, well, the battery adds weight, reduces your capacity. That's why I said, well, as if I own a trucking company, I'm not switching necessarily because this is not like a consumer vehicle. There's other implications beyond just the cost of energy. Now, I'll tell you what, beyond the death threats that I have, there were a lot of smart people on Twitter like Alex who reached out to me and sent me actual schematics and data, which have shifted my mind towards neutral. So I'm not so much gun ho about it anymore. But as I told him, I'll tell you, I'm not sold on the idea entirely. Until I see companies buy it, fleets buy it and actually operate it, I'm, I'm going to pretend like it's not there for my valuation. Well, and I mean, I think that's where the trucking market is now. They're willing to, you know, the Pepsis and the anheuser Bushes. they're saying, we, we should try these out. We have a huge fleet. If this turns out to be a game changer, then we're going to obviously be f some of the first on the list. We're also one of the first on the list. I don't know if Tesla's going to give us the truck before you know, Anheuser-Busch, kind of doubt it, but you know, here's hoping. I'm envious of your ability to get access to this shit. We were just at the event. Yeah, we just, we were just there. They said, hey, you Elon can- Elon said there's a computer over there, go sign up to get it. And I was and like, okay. Just, okay. <laughs> okay, can I, can I get an invite to drive this when, when you guys get yeah. it? We're doing a butts and seats tour, well, dude. you won't tour, have dude. the license, but we'll find some well, we'll off- find a, We'll find a, you know, parking it'll, lot. It'll drive like a Model 3, exactly. so, I mean, I'm not like worried that you're not gonna like, you know, hit the double clutch right. right Is there a clutch? I don't think there's a clutch. No, in there. no, it's gonna drive like a car. <laughs> like that's the that's the crazy part. I mean, that's the it's thing. It's kind of where, autopilot. That's the thing. I mean, later down the line, where it's like you know, 
if 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 you could get an e license for a truck and that made it cheaper for you to get the license, then we can solve well, can, truck driving. And, yeah, can we go into FSD here? Can we talk about well, that? For I want to first hang on. If All the right. capacity, let's say the capacity is reduced, so you can't you can't transport as much stuff, but it is cheaper for you to transport that stuff. Isn't that a very similar argument to? talking about uh toyota right you can't move as much stuff and i know with with shipping you actually have to move stuff and sometimes the the stuff is one size but let's say it's boxes and you just move less boxes i mean if you can move from point a to point b even if you need two trucks and it's still cheaper um maybe ignoring the price of an extra truck but that's amortized i just think that it it would begin to make sense especially if that second truck didn't have a driver in it because it's platooning I don't see why there's reduced weight. Elon said that it could have the same that's gross what he said. weight. That's so, what he said. So I mean, that's Elon's where, always right. That's so. where I've always been sitting. I'm like, I don't think that the capacity is going to go down. I mean, there's so much in a regular truck and there's so much to go wrong. I live right next to a highway because I'm saving up for a house someday. You know, so I'm right next to the freaking highway. Every night there is a truck parked on the side of the highway, broken down, a repaired guy has to come out. That's not cheap. And they're, you know, they're bringing parts. They're fixing it on the side of the road. I just think that if... if Million mile motors. Million mile motors and that kind of thing. I think it's going to start to pay itself off in ways that people just aren't expecting. I mean, for instance, we brought the Rivian uh, to go pick up a, a, a new trailer because we're going to make a, a mobile studio. And the guy was like, all right, so every uh, roughly every three... Uh, oil changes, you're going to want to uh, grease the bearings. And I went, I, I don't know. So <laughs> give it to me in miles because I don't know what that is because we don't have oil changes, you know? And it's like people aren't even starting to consider right. the savings that they're going to be seeing. I believe it when they see it. When they see fleets, I'll take it. History says that Elon has m sometimes been overly optimistic on timing but he has never said something will happen and completely botched the delivery. Yes, he sometimes promises things will happen too fast, but that's because there's a perfectionist and until it's ready, he's not going to release it. We haven't seen a product launch from Tesla basically flop and doesn't do what it's supposed to do. In fact, most of the time they over deliver. If we talk about what autopilot was when it launched, it was like space, like it, like it was sci-fi movie. Never. Now you kind of think of autopilot, well, it's done. When they launched this thing, nobody had it, not even close. People barely had lane assist, like a little bit of adaptive cruise control, nothing of that sort. So let's see it happen. If it plays out, I'm happy to be wrong. I'm a Tesla bull. So, uh, But as it stands right now, until I see it, it's just an, an, an idea. I think that Tesla is... A generational company and that's just looking at tesla as a vehicle manufacturer straight up as a car company they've already shredded the entire market and people don't understand this because like i hear people say well it's only a million cars forget ford and gm they're toast toyota is kind of the king the queen of the auto industry right and they make terrific cars i love toyota they're the gold standard in the industry they've religiously refused to get on the ev uh, agenda for whatever reason and i think it's going to be Unfortunate for them, but that's their business, right? They've refused. VW refused. They had a CEO who actually helped them not to get screwed by that decision. They, then they decided in return to fire him, which I find <laughs> just absolutely hysterically crazy, but we could talk about it later. But So Toyota has worse margins than Tesla right now as it stands. So imagine if we're talking about a company that makes one-tenth of the vehicles of Toyota and has better margins. Like for people who do manufacturing, do you guys understand how insane that is to get more efficiency out of one tenth of the capacity? I mean, for me as a guy who's been who, who consulted clients in manufacturing, my head is literally about to explode of how insane that is. Imagine what happens when Tesla sells 10 million cars a year, which they will, by the way. The demand is almost hard line. People are waiting for six, seven months for for a car, and yes, a recession is going to slow things down a bit. But hey, guess what? In the recession, you don't like to spend a lot of gasoline as well. So there's that. Um, and the, the Model 3 is an affordable car. It's maybe not the cheapest car. It's not a Corolla. It's a no-brainer. Tesla is going to dominate the auto industry. And God knows which other industries. People make fun of the, uh, the Tesla bot. I heard people call it a mannequin on a, on a stick or some bullshit like this. 
they missed the point. They're, this is not a competition against Boston Dynamics. The, the, the brain, the battery, the cost effectiveness of this product is just absolutely mind boggling. I mean, the fact that it's going to have a hand. Yeah. I was just blown away that the robot understands what the f it's seeing, which Boston Dynamics doesn't. Like, it's a, it's a, it's a toy. Uh, anyway, so f make fun of it. You know, Elon Musk, yes. Is he a complex human being? Yes. Does he have 57 ex-wives and 400 kids? Sure. His family is, uh, is very strange to, the, to, to say the least. But I mean, the, the motherfucker can deliver. I'm absolutely bullish on Tesla, not because of the stock market, not because of the macro. And I don't give a crap about the share price. I like to bet on winners. These guys are winners. They've already won. And whatever happens when we have this conversation in uh, 2033, I know for a fact Tesla will be there and they're going to be in the front. I don't know if GM is there. I don't know if Ford is there. Probably not. I don't know what happens they, with Toyotas and VW. Oh, they'll have to restructure somehow to survive this. Um, they, they probably will be there. But I mean, so for me, investing in Tesla is a kind of a monthly thing. Put away to the side every month. Put it in Tesla. Just forget about it. Don't trade it. Don't do nothing. Put it in your 401, 401k, you know, max out your tax advantage accounts, etc. This is kind of a no brainer. There's a whole bunch of reasons why they will do great in the recession, despite the, the expensive price tag, but that's besides the point. The problem with Tesla, if you are a cautious investor, is that based on their multiples, they are priced for total execution. So Tesla's pricing is basically saying, well, Elon isn't going to fail for the next five years. Everything Tesla will launch is going to succeed. Everything will be uh, up to par and it's going to have demand. People have gotten used to thinking that that's not possible because no company does that. What what company launches and every product is a banger? Which CEO never misses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And it's hard for them to accept that there's a company that's built different. And I'll give you an example. If I tell to a professional investor, hey, this is a company with 60% retail participation in the float. The answer I would get almost like this a Pavlovian answer is I will stay the f*** away then. Tesla has always been 60% retail participation, and it never behaved as a retail-driven stock. Yes, it's more volatile than the Microsoft or Google, for sure, but the support, the knowledge, and the sophistication, the analytical skills of the community have always made it kind of immune to the sicknesses that uh, attack retail-heavy stocks, like a Palantir, for example. Tesla has changed the rules with so many things. Is an investor... For me, this is the first time that I got to see a retail heavy, the retail Quinn, right? Tesla's the retail Quinn does, that behaves like a very mature uh, institutional investment heavy company. In the dips, people buy the dip like freaking rabbits, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So as an investor, I'm flexible enough to say, well, yes, this isn't really something I've seen before, but... I'll bet now that Elon doesn't fail for the next five years because I think if I don't bet on it now, in five years, I'm going to have to bet another for another five years and then it's going to be 10 times more expensive. There's a lot of future success baked in into the share price and that's not for everybody. There's a lot of investors who would never touch that. But, but statistically speaking, Tesla has been around for a long time. They've sold a lot of f***ing cars. Their financials are some of the best I've seen. It's not an idea. It's not a concept. They've proven to be ex exceptional at execution, and they're only getting better. There's more capacity, more employees. I mean, the only risk I would say that Tesla has, realistically speaking, is that something happens to Elon. And people say, well, there's a succession plan. Sure, yeah, Apple survived the post-Steve uh, Jobs era, but it was never the same. Uh, Tim Cook took it more to the kind of, uh, he was the COO and he kind of ran it like the best CEO, COO in the world until like, you see the results now, it's basically it. The key man risk with Tesla is probably the only place where I would just, I'll yield and say, yeah, that's a big problem. Um, but I'll take, I mean, there's nothing perfect. There's no perfect stock. I'm really interested in your thoughts on Tesla bot. We just uh, covered the live stream the other day, but now I want to hear your thoughts. You've had time to kind of digest it um, and think about it. What do you think about Tesla bot? I think the, the, for me, the most exciting part was the, the brain part of it. We spoke about it a little bit before we went live. I'm not really that excited about the visuals of it because uh, there's a bias right now in the way people look at it. You have to understand what's the purpose of this idea. Uh, when you see demos from Boston Dynamics and you see these uh, godlike robots that are doing insane, like Terminator level of you know, things, they're jumping up and down, they're agile. It's incredible. 
but uh, it serves a very specific purpose, maybe a military purpose. Uh, it's a, some sort of a gadget, a toy, whatever. It's not even close to being a civilian mass adoption product. It's, it's, it seems more like, like something that the Department of Defense would be really excited about. What I look at this, I say, well, they're building a consumer product. These motherfuckers are building a butler. I'm like, oh my God. I mean, I don't care if my butler isn't, you know, isn't jumping up and down and fucking uh, uh, samurai sword the people. Like, I want them to water my plants, get my groceries, you know, do my laundry, do I don't want to do, bro, right? And uh, the strength of that product was when I saw the demo and we saw into the into the architecture what, what the bot actually sees. And you can see by the color schemes, by the car, the motherfucker knows what he's looking at. It, in some capacity, yes, it's not a human being, but he knows what he's seeing and he, he's able to understand. So for me, I didn't really care about the way they built the robot. I, I couldn't care less about it. I think it, it's nice to have kind of to show the idea of how it's going to. I'm not even sure the bot is going to look like that. Even the final version that they show, who knows? I don't know. Y if you think FSD is impressive, this thing is mind blowing and it's going to be affordable. It's going to be battery uh, energy efficient. Uh, it's 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 like buying a f***ing Dyson vac vacuum at this point. That's what they're going for. So it could be, oh, this uh, this thing uh, isn't behaving like a tank. Yes, because this is a Dyson vacuum and this is a tank. They have different purposes. <laughs> it's like, of course, the Dyson vacuum doesn't look as impressive as a tank, but the, understand the, the, the use case here, right? And they're already designing it for manufacturing. You know, with the I loved how they talked about having spring-loaded tendons in the hands. And that's a simple concept. It's actually not that hard to do physically. And so there was a lot of pushback in the questions and answers. One of the questions was like, why are you doing that? Like, why don't you have fixtures and all this other stuff? And it's like, because it doesn't have to do much more than what a laborer does. Right. A very simple thing. And if the hand breaks, if the cable snaps and it can no longer, you know, pick something up, what what happens when you hurt your hand? Are you completely incapacitated? No. You have other fingers on your on your hand, don't you? And you can still pick up cups with different parts of your hand. And even if your fingers are completely cut off, you can still do that stuff. Oh, that's why you copy humans, because we're pretty well evolved. And I think that that's it's part of it is is they were thinking we're not making the best robot here. It's not going to do backflips like you're saying. It's going to be something that I can afford. Right. I, this is a it's not a race car. It's a Toyota Corolla or a Tesla Model 3. It depends on how you want to look at it of robots. And I just think this decade, it's going to happen. I mean, even if Elon's wrong with this three to five time year plan, and I think he was really good that he didn't say next year. I, he would have been tempted, <laughs> I think, a few years ago to be like, it's next year. Yeah. But he didn't. I think that three to five years is realistic. I don't think it's realistic for a $20,000 bot, but I think- And maybe not, maybe I don't buy it, but maybe right. it's in but Tesla's we, you know, we factories. Came up, we came up with an episode where we said it's probably worth a million dollars to a company because this bot is going to work 24, seven, seven days a week. Until it uh, revolts. Until it revolts, exactly. <laughs> until until the Singularity happens. Right. Exactly. <laughs> until Skynet. So, I mean, up until Skynet, what do you think about the fact that human labor might be coming to an end in our lifetime? First of all, I make a huge distinction between Kathy Wood and Elon Musk. So, Kathy Wood is an interested party in this whole inflation discussion. I don't think her sending letters to the Federal Reserve was a good idea because I think it, it doesn't matter if she's right or wrong. It's a bad look because she has skin in the game. Her entire fund is basically predicated on a comfortable environment for an interest rate environment. So I think it's a bad look. You know, justice has to be not just served, but also seen. So I don't think she should have gotten involved in that. As far as what she's saying and what Elon is saying, the argument itself, it is a good argument. But I think people are misunderstanding uh, the timeline on this. The argument is, look, technology is going to create loss of uh, human labor to the point where a lot of people will be out of a job, a lot of businesses will have to have out of a job. You know, imagine like a McDonald's branch, for example. It's, it probably needs one human being to operate with current existing technology with minor tweaks, right? Right. So if deflation is coming, why do you want to press on the brakes, slam on the brakes now if, if, if it's coming? Well, ask yourself this question. Is this technological advancement that's going to cause uh, cannibalization within the market and is going to stop this uh, inflationary spike. Is it going to happen in 2023? Not likely. Is it going to happen in 2024? Maybe. We're probably looking at 2025, 6, 7. Like f 
Yes, in the next five to 10 years, the economy as we know it will change because of uh, AI and AGI and whatnot. And it's going to be a different world. We've adjusted before when jobs went away and never came back. We'll have to adjust again. There have to be uh, humanity, you know, uh, survives when uh, people stop working uh, at, at factories and we have machinery. It, everything will be okay. People re readjust. Yes, it will have a deflationary impact, but it has nothing to do with the current inflationary pressures. Right now, we're talking about massive amount of money fl floating in the system. Companies that have uh, gotten used to free money that went exuberantly high into leverage and people who have basically forgot what it's like to uh, pay for, for loans. And we have this crazy situation right now where it's spiraling out of control and this innovation, deflationary impact we're talking about that's going to come in five or six years, which is inevitable, has nothing to do with this thing right now. They're right, but their timing is... is, is and Elon, he, he thinks on these levels of five to 10 years. He's not the kind of guy who thinks about, oh, this is what's going to happen 2022, 20. I think he's talking about more of a greater picture kind of thing. 2022, 2023, we need real solutions to slow down demand. And that's a very nice word to use when, in fact, what I mean is push the economy into recession so that people will buy less shit prices will slow down they're not going to become cheaper by the way that's the crazy part people don't understand this zero percent inflation means the prices stay as they are and even the fed is saying well we're only going to, we want to have two percent inflation so prices never go down in history once prices have gone up for sure they, they'll never come down so we need right now the entire economy to just chill the f down just sitting back and saying well not offloading the balance sheet let's just keep interest rates insanely low and let's just wait for the robots to replace humans so we can uh, deflate is is kind of irresponsible in my opinion so if i'm watching right now and i'm an investor and i'm you know okay i get tesla but look there's a lot of other innovation and disruptive companies out there and i want to know what they are but i'm not like take me for example i know that medicine for instance is going to be completely disrupted in the next 10 and 20 years but i don't follow every dna company out there so what do i do do i invest in like an arc invest genomics or something like that so that i follow these trends or do i have to start getting smarter about what i invest in that's the big problem with this industry like when you're talking about uh, biotech in general, not talking about pharmaceuticals because that's a whole different story, but like medical technology, medical devices, I've never understood that part because the odds of success are very slim. It's every client I had when I used to work for Deloitte that works in medical devices, medical technology, biotech, it's like restaurant level of odds of success. Like it's so low, the regulatory pathway are insane. The R&D pathway, at minimum, is 10 to 15 years just to get off the ground. The amount of R&D spent is insane. So, but the jackpot for those who make it is out of this world. But every single client we worked with it didn't make it one way or the other. Somewhere along the, the way, it just fell through. It, it, like some went as close as almost getting to transfer to production, couldn't, couldn't get it done on from prototype level to to actual mass production, the product just didn't work and spending millions of dollars to try to get work failing eventually. They're talking about Rivian, production is fucking hard, right? I agree with you. Medicine is going through a massive uh, sea change. I personally don't know how to play it. It's just, for, it, for me, there's such a low odds game. It's like going into a casino and playing roulette. It's like I'd rather play a skill game, a poker or at least a blackjack medicine, medical device, it's very hard to pick the winners because it's a, all of them are story stocks. I think the only ones who have a shot at getting this right, not as a bet, by the way, but like statistically right, is MDs. It's like me playing basketball against a pro bowler. It's, it's stupid. I'm not going to win that game. I'm humble enough to tell you I honestly don't know. How about things like other car companies and mining companies and battery recycling companies? Um, you know, we talk about a lot of the Chinese companies, for example, that are, you know, BYD, NEO, Xpong, and even the Vietnamese companies like VinFast that are all coming into the market. What about those? I mean, even though Tesla, we, you know, we strongly believe in them, but we think there's probably going to be other players. What about investing in companies like that that are, t you know, really into EVs? Not a fan of... Uh, of uh Neo, Xpeng, and all these players. I'm a huge fan of BYD. 
the the one player that can actually I can see uh, alongside Tesla as far as capacity in-house technology vertical integration massive skill set uh, it's just endless resource BYD is a beast and doesn't get enough coverage on US media for some reason I don't know why everybody thinks that Neo is the, Neo is irrelevant in China BYD is the real thing bro and they're global they're exporting they're actually getting sales it's them and Geely basically are the real deal uh, and Geely also have an EV play by the way most people in the US don't know this uh, it's shit right now but it, they're, they're getting there I mean they're getting better the problem with the uh, with Chinese companies despite my love for BYD and uh, my appreciation for Geely is that they're located in a very, very problematic business environment. I, if you watch my channel, you know that I've been very critical of China. I'm not even going to go into the moral stuff or none of that, just talking on, on the business front. I think that China is busy signaling into the world of how much of a superpower they want to be, when the reality is that they have a lot of problems. China is, as, 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 a, as a country is dealing with massive energy issues, with massive demographic issues, cost of uh, uh, human resources is skyrocketing. They're literally struggling to keep the lights on and feed the people over there. It's, it's not an easy task with such a massive population. Their whole real estate market is hanging on a thread right now. Their whole GDP is basically, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but the, the GDP structure in China, that massive growth you kept hearing about for the past like 20 years, more recently, it's basically the real estate market. There were like one third of the Chinese GDP is just the real estate market. And that whole thing, if you think that Bitcoin is a Ponzi scheme, which it's not, by the way, the Chinese real estate market is like makes Bitcoin look like a Wall Street uh, um, mutual fund. <laughs> that thing is like, uh, I can tell you stories later. So not to mention about the geopolitical instability, not to mention about the lack of corporate governance, not to mention about the ab arbitrary decision making by regulators and such, the instability of the banking system. So, so that environment just as an investor in the Chinese company that's in EVs makes it uninvestable. I'm, I'm looking at BYD. I say, I would love to be an investor in BYD. And that's why Warren Buffett, by the way, invested in because like, look at the fundamentals. They're f brilliant. That's that's number two right there after Tesla, right? They're going to make it. Sh yes, but they're living in the climate that is going to jeopardize everything that they're working for. Not on their fault, by the way. And for me as an investor, that's added risk that I don't have to take. Luckily for us, the government in the US isn't strong enough to fuck up Tesla, like the Chinese government <laughs> to BYD. Thank God, it, they haven't, it's not like they haven't, not for lack of trying, by the way, <laughs> but luckily it's a mumbling idiot that doesn't know what the is doing, thank God. The US government doesn't have the power to, to fuck with Tesla, but trust me, the Chinese government does have the power to fuck with BYD and, and Gili. Didi Global was Uber, that's gone. Ant was the biggest IPO in, in history, gone. Jack Ma, God knows where he is. Like, this is like too much risk for no, I don't need this risk. Not to mention the fact that as an investor, you're taking on extra risk and you're getting a, a contractual right for profits instead of an actual ownership of the company. I don't know if a lot of people are familiar with that, but in China, you invest in the VAE, which is variable interest uh, entity, which is basically a uh, Cayman Islands or Guernsey or whatever offshore Shell company that has nothing but a contractual right to get profits from the Chinese company. Guys, would you buy a car from me? And I'll tell you, hey, here's the car. You don't get the deed, but I'll sign the paper that I'll give you the deed someday or whatever. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, then how about other companies like Ford, GM, Toyota, Honda? I know that you're saying that most of them won't survive. We think so, too. But mm -hmm. a lot of people are looking. I mean, we have the new Ford F-150 Lightning. It's pretty cool. Uh, so what's wrong with that? Isn't Ford getting into all this? Toyota, again, I'm not an expert on the industry or the industry like you guys are, but to me, it seems Toyota is absolutely self-inflicted and I have no idea why. It sounds to me more like a cultural stubbornness where they're like, uh, they refuse to admit that uh, they were wrong about this. And I get it. It's a family business. Toyota, I think, will still be okay because, look, it takes for this EV change to happen globally, the way, like, we're talking about Norway, US, Western Europe, yes, that happens sooner than later, but India and Third World, there's a lot of cars to be sold, which Toyota will keep selling for years. So I don't think Toyota are going away. 
even if they refuse to get on on board of this. Yes, they'll take a hit, but they'll be fine. Now, Honda, I'm not, I honestly don't know enough about. I don't know what their EV plays are, to be honest. I haven't heard about them in a while, so I don't know. I, with Ford and GM, it's very interesting cases. Luckily for Ford, the single-handedly best category to be in in the US is trucks. I have friends who drive like a 16-year-old F-150s. They're brand new. So if their threshold for success in that category with an EV product is very low. But let me push back because we've been driving around and the one comment we get from people, which is true, is the price. Like we're, we have the middle level Lariat and it's like 80,000. I think it just went up to 87,000. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of money for a pickup truck. And then the elephant in the room, Cybertruck. Over a million people signed up for that thing. Now I know it's controversial. People are like, you love it or you hate it. But like we rode in it and it was amazing feeling. It feels like you're in a Porsche. Uh, what happens next year if Elon keeps to his timeline and the Cybertruck comes out and it's if it's successful, what do you think is going to happen? I don't think it will be an F-150 killer. Ford will have to figure out a way to make the product cheaper. F-150 people will still drive an F-150. It's a different product, in my opinion. If you are a painter, carpenter, whatever, and you like your F-150 for functionality, you don't give a f that it feels like a Porsche. It's pointless. They, they have different use cases, in my opinion. Tesla is going to sell a lot of Cybertrucks, but their presence in this category, I think, is what saves their ass, at least for a while. You're missing it, Tom. I think the Cybertruck's going to eat Ford's lunch, and here's a couple reasons why. One, made of stainless steel. So if I'm a truck guy, this thing ain't going to rust. Um, and this thing is made that's of, the only thing that kills trucks. And, and the mean, other thing is, this I, is thick stainless steel. Like, we whacked our hand on it. This mm -hmm. thing is not going to dent. The second is, if Elon is so efficient with his trucks, which he is with his cars, that means that this truck will be efficient to run and cheaper to buy. And I think already we're looking at a really expensive Ford option. So if Cybertruck, I look, I don't think they're going to be able to come in at 39.9, which they said they would. I think inflation and all that is going to push them up. There is no way in the hell they sell it for the grand. There's no way. But I think if they can come in at 10 grand over that as their starting price truck, then I think that they're going to beat Ford in the price category. And so if you beat them in price, now it's just looks. I was at the event. And the first hour, everyone said, that is God ugly. I will never sign up for that truck. I was sitting there with a phone and, and thousands of people told me how they would never buy that truck. And then 24, 48 hours later, those people exact like, same fucking people mm -hmm. ordered the truck. They put down $100 on the truck. And these are people the who have never same people. And these are people who have never seen it in person. It right. does look different in person. Yes. I think that there is a certain familiarity with owning an F-150. It's it's a cultural icon. For me like as a Russian, for me America is Coca-Cola F-150. But I used to own a Polaroid, man, like, and, mm -hmm. and a Kodak, and I don't anymore. Like, we went to Blockbuster uh -huh. video. Yep. Taking away the crown from the F-150, it can happen, but I think it's much, it's not going to be this change in culture like we've seen in, when, in four-door sedans. Because honestly, there's no loyalty in four-door sedans. There's absolutely nothing. With trucks, there's there's a bond between the man and this truck. It's very hard to break it. So we'll see. We'll see. Oh, oh, acceleration will break <laughs> many bonds. Also, a bulletproof truck will break. Yes. It. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm I'm excited. I'm just excited as you are because I do think that it is uh it is a very difficult challenge for a Tesla to to accomplish. Yeah. Also, look look. There's a production aspect here. Uh, they're still struggling to produce X and uh, and S. There's there's so much demand, so little capacity. So there's a lot of time for Ford to get their sh together and figure out a competitor for this. But we'll see. I'm not rooting for for Ford to to go out of business. I just want to circle back to you know if Elon's right and say five years he's got um, Tesla bots working in his factories, even if he hasn't sold them yet to the public, if he's, even if he's just testing them out in his factories, that makes Tesla so much more efficient. Um, I mean, that, that means they can work 24 hours a day. And I just think that that is just going to make it really hard for companies like Ford and Honda to, to compete. Yeah. Like imagine having no, no, no employees that needs to pee, sh eat, uh, rest. Knowing Elon, he's going to give the bots options. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably right. And then lastly, Tom, what are your thoughts about uh, Starlink? Um, the fact that it could go public at some point, um, maybe even SpaceX would go public at some point. Are you are you waiting for that day? Are you, are you excited about that? I think everybody's excited about SpaceX potentially going public. Uh, there is no reason absolutely for him to do it. He's raising as much money as he wants at whatever valuation he wants. As a Russian, I wouldn't, and I'm the kid of the 80s, 
Russian missile technology, irreplaceable, right? That's the concept we grew up in. Like, the CUs is the only way. Like, f the CUs. This thing go flies back and up, lands like reusable. Like, the f is this? Like, it's sci fi, shit, right? You can actually make money of sending to space and back. I mean, imagine that, right? Tom, thank you again so much for your time. I'm so excited to have gotten a chance to talk to you. And I know that we're going to be visiting you on your channel soon. So I'm really looking forward to that as well. Thanks, guys. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Tom.